Welcome to the Data Leadership Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algman. Data is everywhere in our businesses, and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. We've partnered with Dataversity to provide listeners with 20% off your first training center purchase with promo code AlgmanDL. Go to dataleadershiptraining.com to learn more. Today on episode 76, we welcome William Attaway. William is a leadership coach for Catalytic Leadership LLC, a company he founded to help leaders intentionally grow and thrive. He has served in local church ministry for 25 years and is currently the lead pastor of Southview Community Church in Herndon, Virginia, where he served since 2004. He loves to read and speak about leadership, organizational change, archaeology, and building up people in teams. His newest book is Catalytic Leadership from January of 2022. William, welcome to the show. Anthony, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Outstanding. We're excited to have you. So please take a few minutes and just tell us a bit more about your career leading up to what you're doing now with the church and with your book and kind of how all of these experiences fed together to helping you do what you do now. Sure. You know, I attended my first leadership conference when I was 15 years old. Uh, from there, I moved into the business world and I've always been a student of leadership. Uh, trying to learn what it is that makes a leader, how leaders get better, what makes great leaders and what makes terrible leaders, because I think you can learn from anybody. I started in the business world, uh, working for Bell South Mobility, and moved from there into the church world and the nonprofit sector. Uh, and for the last almost 25 years now, I've been in that world, in the nonprofit church world. And I've seen leadership from both sides of that fence. And one of the opportunities that I've had is coaching leaders, helping them to get better. I think when a leader gets better, everybody gets to benefit from that. Everybody on the team, everybody in the organization, every client, every customer, the mission ultimately benefits when a leader gets better. So, I, I, and you're the first person we've had kind of from that, that religious side of, of the fence. And, and so I'm curious about this. And, and having been a student of business and, and leadership for your entire career, what are the kinds of differences that you notice in working in kind of traditional organizations versus being in this kind of public service role in a, in a religious capacity? You know, that's a great question. There's there's one thing that stands out immediately when you ask that. In the business world, uh, KPIs, goals, organizational metrics, these are all things that we measure and we know where we're going. In the church world, people tend to say, oh, well, what we do is spiritual. You can't really measure that. There's not really data that we... Okay, I think that's just lazy. I think you just have to work harder to find it. But I have metrics that I measure every single week. I have metrics I measure every single month. And it has to go beyond the ones that are readily available on the surface. So there are things that I dig into to evaluate because I think every decision needs to be a data-based decision. Sure. And so do you have an example of, of kind of the data that you might be using as in your leadership on in, in religion mm -hmm. um, that may compare similarly or differently from what you've used otherwise because I, I would agree with you that the data is there like the data is going to be useful there's no way in my mind that we can make the argument that like oh well it's hard like this is so now, now you're gonna get me on my soapbox because <laughs> what what bothers me in this whole data governance world i do a lot of work in data governance and data strategy and like we're the ones who are supposed to be like, hey, let's be data driven. Let's drive, you know, activities and decisions with data. And then we're like, so what is what is the value of data governance? And we're like, well, it's hard. We can't quite <laughs> figure this out. And we're like, come on, that you can't do that. So I, I'm not going to buy that religion is, is totally different in that you can't quantify some of this stuff. There's got to be data that can help you understand, hey, am I doing a good job in the kind of change I'm trying to drive? Because that's what leadership really is about. It's about saying, okay, we have something we are trying to do here. How do we make that possible? There has to be some data. You know, The data is as close to, as we get in our organizations to truth in terms of something we can measure and, and identify. That has to be there. So I'm with you. Help me understand what, what those things are. Sure. In, in my context currently, there are five large areas that we track and measure. Uh, we call these our five G's, right? So one yeah. of these G's has to do with small groups, with community, because we believe that that's where growth happens. It happens in the context of being in community with other people. Well, yeah. so the easy metric there, the one that's sitting on the surface is how many people are, are actively attending a group? 
how many people are actively in community each month. Okay, that's on the surface, that's great. But there are other metrics there that if we dig just a little bit deeper, we can say, are we moving the ball up the field or are we simply maintaining a machine from the past? For instance, mm -hmm. one of the metrics that we look at is how many new people engaged in community this month compared to last quarter, compared to this quarter last year, right? How many people are dropping out? How many people are no longer in community? How wide is the back door, for instance? These are not metrics that are typically evaluated, but I find them to be incredibly helpful because data tells a story. And I wanna know what that story is. I wanna read that story. I love to read. Well, data is a story if you read it correctly. That's one metric. Another one, one, another one of our Gs is using the spiritual gifts that you have, the gifts, the passions, the skills, the talents you have for the benefit of other people, right? So mm -hmm. how many people are currently serving using their gifts in some capacity? That's an easy metric to track. But how many new people are doing that? How many new people are engaging in that? How many people have drifted away from that? These are metrics we need to dig deeper into. I wanna measure that per area, per department. Right, because I want to know, hey, which departments are killing it right now? Which ones are knocking it out of the park? This is part of the story. But these are metrics that we track every single month, right? I want to see the whole picture at least once a month. A lot of these I'm looking at every week because I think when we have the data, when we understand the metrics, we know what we're aiming at and we can measure it. It helps us to make adjustments as we need to real time. And I mean, as I hear you talk, you could actually be describing a whole number of, of different kinds of businesses or industries and not even just like public sector stuff like they, this is foundational. This yeah. is like, how are we functioning as any kind of organization? And that I think is, yeah. you know, it's the right approach. And I think that, you know. Uh, the the religious I and, and I debate I'll be completely open to my audience out there and to you as my guest I debated about whether or not you'd be a good guest for this podcast because I'm like do I really want to go down any kind of conversation with religion or some of these other areas that that would be you know a, a, a potential hot button or, or potentially turn off the audience and I'm like well why not you know I want to explore I want to learn yeah. and and what you just talked about, though, I think validates why I wanted to have you on the show is that things are more similar than they are different. And I yes. don't know. I don't even know what religion you ascribe to. And I don't know what our audience is or, or, or ascribe to or and, 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 you know, that's a very personal thing. But to me, when I think about building community, when I think about establishing help and, and, and broadening that, I mean, community underlies everything to me and like to to organization your 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 organizational community your company community but like just the place in which we live the fabric i think about my town that i live in and and how i'm part of that community and then efforts towards building these communities don't happen in isolation they have to be coordinated they have to be participated in and they have to be managed yes. and if you don't measure these things and if you don't have somebody like in your case where you're working towards helping your church be as effective as it can be in its mission if you don't have somebody sitting there there's no chance that it's going to be as effective any other way and that to me i think is a great lesson that we can all learn and apply in any of the leadership that we want to do so thank you for letting me sneak in that kind of Ex Absolutely. exposition but i think it's an important one for people to realize hey these things are everywhere and these data leadership lessons apply at work at home in our community everywhere we are and i think that's an important lesson to take away i, I agree Anthony. I it begins with defining what a win is you have to define the win first once you define the win you back into that and say okay what is that going to look like in this area in this area in this area and each one of those can be broken out and it doesn't matter what you do i did the same thing in the corporate world right but now i'm taking it and trying to say hey this this mission what i'm doing now i believe matters a great deal i believe this is significant well if it matters that much shouldn't we bring our best selves to it shouldn't we bring our best efforts to it shouldn't should we say hey this deserves everything i can throw at it I think it does, which means I've got to define the win. I've got to back into it and say, what are the metrics that we need to measure so that we can get better, right? There is no such thing as stasis outside of a laboratory. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. That's a great, that's a great point. I mean, and it, and it, I, anytime I see someone that has the kind of passion that you have for doing good, 
to me, that's what it's all about. Like, it's all about that passion for improving. And and I think your point around stasis is well made. It, it's, you don't, you know, maintaining, treading water is a theoretical concept. It's not yeah. really likely because you're probably in reality, improving in some ways, declining in other ways. I mean, we're all getting older. We're all probably experiencing more aches and pains than we once did. There's a decline <laughs> over time on that, right? And That's so right. it's like, there. it's a complex system. Yeah. And so to the notion of staying static with anything is, is kind of fallacy. And I think yeah. about that sometimes at work too. It's like, am I getting better at what I do or am I losing something that I do well? And have I not found every opportunity to do what I do best and grow what I do best and, and expand that and apply that? Or am I missing things or, or letting somebody down inadvertently because I'm focused in other areas for whatever reasons yeah. that either strategically or tactically, I should be doing something else and constantly questioning that I think is, is, important without going so far to you can you can reach this point where if you go so far in questioning this or analyzing this or whatever you you have no time to move you have no time to actually do real stuff and so how do you find i'm curious now in 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 the work that you do now how do you balance that how do you balance understanding of what's working and not versus going out and doing stuff. Cause I imagine you have no shortage of opportunities to be doing stuff, right? <laughs> There's no shortage of things to do. No doubt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's a matter of prioritization. And this is one of the things that I coach other leaders on. I think every experience we have in our lives is beneficial. Right. I think it's beneficial because we have the opportunity to pour that and invest that into other people. No experience is accidental, right? Every opportunity, every experience is, is an opportunity to, to share that for the benefit of other people. So what I've learned over time is how to balance the strategic and the tactical side of things. The strategic is, is what we're talking about, right? Evaluating the data, gathering the data, looking at the data and, and making interpretations of it. The tactical is what do you do with that? Right. How are we going to make adjustments? What are we going to do? If you spend all your time over here evaluating the data, you can, like you say, you can just sit in the numbers all day, but you never get anything done. If you spend all your time on the tactical, you could very well be spending all your time busy, but you're not doing the right things. You're not making decisions and taking action based on the appropriate data. It's got to be a both end, not an either or. So we get to choose. So I have to block time in my schedule where I'm going to look, I'm going to evaluate data every week, every month. I'm going to carve that out because it's a priority for me. It's part of my review process. It's why evaluation matters so much to me. People think experience makes you better. I don't think experience makes you better at all. I think evaluated experience makes you better. <laughs> and so evaluation is a core part of how I operate as a leader and how I pour into and coach other leaders to operate. As you evaluate, that's going to affect what you do. That's going to affect the tactical, right? But you have to have both. It cannot be either or. It just, the way I think about it is it's like, it's one thing to make a mistake. We're all going to make mm -hmm. mistakes. We're all going to do something that wasn't uh, optimal, yes. right? But we don't want to compound that by failing to learn from that or even worse failing to acknowledge or understand what that mistake was or why that mistake was made right. and and it's may not even keep it from happening in the future but there's a, a knowledge mistake that i think is often worse yeah. than the initial mistake and there's plenty of times where you're like oh i should have known better than that <laughs> but at least look back at it and understand, okay, well, here's here's why that happened. Here's why I went into this with a good faith idea of why I thought this was going to lead to a good outcome, and it didn't. Fine. But now I can understand that and use that data in the future to say, okay, am I going down this bad path again? Aha, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change direction earlier on, and I'll, I'll have benefited from that. But it's so easy to miss these things when we're not being consciously aware. Or like you said, schedule that time to yeah. do the analysis, to do that, that, that review, or otherwise you're just going to miss it. And by the time you look back to it, it's going to be faded. It's going to, you're going to miss those really key things. And that's, um, yes. you know, it's really good advice, I think. So I want to learn, I, I, I want to understand better, like the underlying nature of this, this catalytic leadership. So mm -hmm. help me understand what are the underpinnings of this and how did you, how did you arrive at this? And, and I, I imagine we may have already been talking about it without realizing, but like, 
what what is catalytic leadership and, and how did you come up with with this you know when i went to college i went as a pre-pharmacy major uh, oddly hmm. uh, because i had worked in a pharmacy in high school and had started to work toward training as a tech and thought this would be a great way that i could serve other people i could pour into them and, and help them in a very real and tangible way Went through the first year, got to inorganic chemistry, got to organic chemistry, and discovered that this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life, uh, as so many people do. In my very brief chemistry studies that first year and a half, uh, I discovered something called a catalyst. And a catalyst is something that you introduce that is going to incite significant change or action. Now, I love that idea. And I think that is what makes an effective, great leader. Somebody who is going to incite significant change or action. I don't know a great leader that that would not apply to. Where they don't, they, they want to come in and they want to make something happen. They want to move the ball up the field, right? That's what leadership is. That's what we do. The problem is that involves change, right? And change is not something people typically love. Now, I do, but most people don't, and, and I get that. Uh, I've heard it said that the only person who really likes change is a wet baby, uh, or the person whose idea the change was. I get that. The, the, the challenge is, I think, as leaders, we want to move the ball. We want to incite significant change, growth, achievement, action. We have to lead that. That's our job. Catalytic leadership is focused on helping leaders to choose intentionally to grow in such a way that they are going to be that change agent. They are going to be the one who is leading the charge. They're going to be the one that's moving the ball and it's going to be measurable because we're evaluating it. Right. And this is something that, that's a key part of what it means to be a catalytic leader. So. I'm 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 trying to think about where um, where this differentiates from other leadership approaches that that I've seen or, or thought of um, because I'm I'm sitting here nodding my head I'm like yep yep I'm in I'm in like I like this this is good um, and 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 that's where I'm I'm I the the notion of being a catalyst mm -hmm. is that the 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 data as a catalyst to the leader or the leader as a catalyst to the organization? Like which of those meanings is, is more appropriate? I think the leader as a catalyst to the organization. Uh, because as I said earlier, you know, when a, when a leader begins to affect change, when a leader is growing intentionally, when they're choosing this on purpose, that's going to affect everything. That's going to affect every person that they lead, every one of their direct reports. That's going to affect every person in the organization that they touch even tangentially. And it's going to affect the organization's mission and whether they're going to achieve what they're trying to achieve. You know, right. So so how would this then if that's if that's what you're, you're um, implying with with catalytic leadership, which I'm totally on board with, makes sense. How does that differ from like a traditional mantra of like leading by example? <laughs> like how what is catalytic leadership compared to something more benign or banal like that? Um, kind of statement that's a great question I, in in the book that i published earlier this year what i did was i captured 12 uh principles that i think if you're going to boil catalytic leadership down and say this is what it is these are the 12 principles and and each one of these principles comes out of the coaching of leaders that i've been doing both inside and outside the church world in nonprofit, in government in the social sector in business you know c-suite coaching these leaders, what I've discovered is that these principles are transferable. Uh, the catalytic leaders exist in every one of those environments. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm outside of Washington, D.C. Obviously, the government sector is very large here. Most of the people either work for the government or work for contractors who work for the government. And so, <laughs> like, that's a, for the last 18 years, this is the environment that I've lived in. What I've discovered is that these principles are just as transferable here as they are in a church world or that they are in a solopreneur or a founder. Okay, so what, what differentiates this from other different types of leadership? It, honestly, you know, I stand on the shoulders of people who've gone before me. You know, I, I have mentors who have trained in me personally and from afar, and, and I'm the beneficiary of that. My goal is to be a conduit of that, not just a reservoir of it. Right? I, I don't wanna just hold it all in and keep it for me and say it's just gonna be for me and mine. No, 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 no. As leaders, I think, we have, to, we have to share what we've learned. That's the beauty of being a catalyst. One of the principles is that you cultivate an intentionally teachable spirit. 
Um, what does that mean? Well, the idea of teachability is very difficult to foster in somebody else. You either have it or you don't, but you make the choice for yourself. You decide whether you're going to be curious or whether you're going to know it all. You decide whether you're going to, to seek out opportunities to be stretched, to grow beyond yourself and what your experience and what your knowledge base is, or whether you're just going to stay comfortable and listen to your own echo chamber that you've carefully constructed of people who think sound and, and work like you do. Mm -hmm. I think catalytic leaders are going to intentionally cultivate a teachable spirit. I loved what you said earlier. You know, I wasn't really sure about having you here because you're outside of what our normal our thing is, but but I wanted to learn. I love that. That's catalytic leadership because that's a teachable spirit. I think you can learn from anybody. I study leaders across disciplines, across history, because I think you can learn from anybody. Sometimes you learn what not to do, but I think that can be just as valuable, sometimes more so. I think that that resonates a lot. And I think that makes, you know, it, it, there's this kind of universal leadership journey, like the mm -hmm. leadership evolution is more alike than different. We have our yes. different scenarios, we have our different roles, our different companies and all of that are, you know, they're adjectives, mm -hmm. they're descriptors, but they're not foundational the same way as like human nature and, and right. kind of leadership fundamentals. So I'm with you on, on all of that. There's a part of me, I'm, I'm curious, I've, I've made a, I don't know if it's a joke, but I've made it an observation coming out. We're, we're currently in, in you know, March, April of, of 2022. We're coming out of the pandemic, hopefully, and, and things are loosening up and, and people are getting back to work and all this stuff. There's a part of me that is like, coming out of the last couple of years, we're all a little bit introverted. We're all a little bit like wanting to have some stability and it's partially because some things have been changing like crazy mm -hmm. and some things have not changed at all yeah. and it's a been a strange dynamic over the uh, over the past couple of years but i, I kind of want to contrast what we were talking about earlier around how you're either improving or you're declining in anything with this notion of like okay we get we want to be change agents we want to be driving change and and, and we want to hopefully be creating that positive change right but i also imagine it's not feasible to change everything all the time for the better there's got to be some sort of throttling of like how much change can people reasonably handle without it becoming actually destructive mm -hmm. like because there's got to be some balance there how how do you manage that in in the context of catalytic leadership I talk about change management like a rubber band. You may have heard this or, or even used this yourself before. A rubber band can be stretched, right? But if you stretch it too far, too fast, what happens? It pops. It breaks, yeah. And then it's no longer a rubber band anymore. It's no longer useful for what it was intended. Uh, I think change management is a lot like that. I think we have to stretch as leaders. We have to pull, we have to tug outside of where we have been, outside of what is comfortable, but we have to be so careful not to pop the rubber band, which means we're gonna pull and we're gonna loosen. We're gonna pull and we're gonna loosen. We're gonna pull and we're gonna loosen. And over time, it's gonna have a much greater footprint than it did at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But if you try to go too far too fast, what you're gonna find is that you cause destruction, just like you were talking about. It's, I like that analogy a lot. And it makes me think more tactically around like how we manage agile teams or, mm -hmm. or even just project management in general. It's yeah. like, there's always that pressure to do more faster. We gotta mm -hmm. go, we gotta go quicker and we gotta deliver more. And, and you know, when I'm working with organizational leadership and we're, we're managing uh, building out of, of technologies or whatever it is that we're, we're doing in our project, you know, I'll be the first to admit, I'm like, if you want it faster, we can operate at 105% of our stated capacity for a period of time. <laughs> yeah. But next cycle, we're going to be down to 90% or 85% because people need that recuperation time. And sure. so we can we can press above 100%. It's, it is it is possible to do more than 100%. Um, although I do get irritated when people are like, I'm 1000% committed. I'm like, <laughs> now you're just making up math. Like, you don't get to do that anymore. Right. But, but like, but 105% is actually a viable thing. Mm -hmm. You can press above your your normal capacity sure. but there's a consequence to that and yes. how do you manage that and how do you make it sustainable over time because you don't make it sustainable by saying we're going to be at exactly 100 all of the time right. it's like trying to stay perfectly neutral all the time 
doesn't work. You can yes. be a little bit above, a little bit below, but you don't want to be too far below either because then actually the the things get brittle. They degrade. You you are no longer capable of what used to be your 100% That's because right. you've lost. It's like you're atrophying um, in terms of your change pacing. So I think that that leader really is about understanding through data and through mm -hmm. understanding the, the the qualitative aspects of your team dynamics and of, of like in, in the context of a church, of your community and, and the people that you're working with, like what what is their temperature? What mm -hmm. is the their capacity for change right now? Mm -hmm. And how do I make sure that they're constantly being challenged enough without being pushed past what they're really able to handle? And, yes. and gauging that isn't all data it isn't all art it's some some way in in between have you found any specific techniques that that help you manage that because i imagine you're you're probably juggling dozens of these constantly at different levels depending on whom you're talking to or which community you're working with absolutely i think there's a rhythm to it and i think discovering discerning that rhythm is something that a leader has to do and it's going to be different for each organization there's going to be some unique elements for whatever you're leading but it's also going to be unique for the people that you lead. And I think this is where discovering their wiring and your own wiring come in. And I talk about this in the book. This is another principle. You have to understand how you're wired. You know, you talk about coming out of COVID, everybody's a little more introverted. Well, you know, if everybody were to take the Myers-Briggs, right, and, and you see where you fall on the introvert, extrovert spectrum, that's a, that's a data point. Right. OK, so this is this is today a snapshot of where I am. If you were to take a disk. OK, here's another data point. If you were to use Patrick Lencioni's working genius model. OK, here's a data point of where your working genius is. This is great. These are all data points and they help us to, to grow in our own self-awareness. That's one piece. But do you understand how you, the people that your direct reports are wired? Do you understand their wiring? Because that's going to affect their rhythm. That's going to affect your rhythm and the organizational rhythm. So I know this for each one of my direct reports. I know exactly how they are wired. I know what their mm -hmm. rhythms are. You have to begin also to see them beyond the, the 2D versions that we so often see at work. People are 3D. <laughs> they really are. They have a life beyond what you see from, from 8 to 4 or 9 to 5 in the office. Yeah. Well, if you understand that, that becomes a part of your understanding of the rhythm as well. Individuals have rhythms. Organizations have rhythms. We're coming up now just a few weeks out from Easter, right? For us, that's a pretty big deal. That's kind of like the Super Bowl for us. So Easter, big deal. This is a very intense season coming up to that. I know that. I know what that's doing to our team. I know what that's doing to all the people who are making that a big priority. What's going to happen right after that? Well, I'm going to say, now we got to keep going at 200%. No, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, okay, now we need to pull the throttle back just a little bit because there's a rhythm to this, right? We're going to go hard and fast, and then we're going to let it settle a little bit. We're going to stretch the rubber band, and then we're going to let it back a little bit. But I already know when we're going to stretch next. I've already got that. I see that coming, and I know when that's going to be. I plot out those rhythms based on data. History of data helps me to make those decisions intentionally, not just haphazardly, not just based on, on how I feel in the moment. That's a recipe for disaster uh, because then you're just, you're just at the whim of somebody's emotional state, however that may be affected by what's going on in their world. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, and, and I think about when, when you're in that kind of contracting time where you're where you're letting up a little bit that's such a great time to be looking at the data and yes. understanding better yes. taking those those breaths and those moments to think about okay that last big push what what went well what didn't like this yes. is why we do you know the, the the retrospectives in the agile community is because we we know that we have to take a breath we have to reconsider and we want to get better for next time that's and right. make it a little bit easier to achieve the same amount or put the same energy in and and achieve more so i think we we see these patterns all over the place and it and it's interesting to get your perspective on it because it's right on like this is this is universally true yes. of any kind of of change uh, that we're managing so we're, we're the, the time's flying by here, but there's a couple more questions that I want to ask you. So yeah. one of the things that you uh, do a fair amount of talking about is, is um, you know, in, in managing organizations, a key piece, especially right now with, with like what we're talking about with coming out of the pandemic and stuff, the, the job market remains extremely tight. You know, people are leaving for new positions. A lot of us are, are struggling to find the talent that we need uh, for our teams. But there's one piece that you talk about that I think is, is a unique perspective. And I'd like to, to hear you talk a little bit more about it is around when we think about when we're doing interviews. 
use. And we're, we're looking to recruit for our team. Now, we all have different things that we need for the positions or whatever, but a common thing that we do is evaluate candidates for fit. Yeah. And I'm really curious about how you determine whether fit is right, because it feels to me like if not managed carefully, we default to things like us. Yes. And like that is actually opposed to what we were talking about earlier, where you want that diversity of thought, you want that diversity of experience. Fit is just like a, a dog whistle for saying, we don't want any of the stuff that we just said we want. <laughs> and so how do we avoid that? How do we, how do we manage fit interviews appropriately? Boy, I think you have to be so intentional here. I really do. And this is this this plays into some of the stuff we've already talked about. You know, you have to understand your wiring first. You have to be aware enough of yourself and how you are designed, what you're bringing to the table. You have to understand what the other team members who are still there are bringing to the table before you then say, what do we need that we don't currently have? Mm -hmm. Right. That's an intentional choice. Whether you're looking at the Myers-Briggs, whether you're looking at the disc, whether you're looking at the working genius, I want these balanced around our tables. Right. I don't want a, a, a table full of, of C's like me. I'm a high C on the disc. I, I don't want a table full of C's. That is not helpful to the organization. That is not helpful to me as the point leader. Right. I need more than that. I need people to bring what I don't have. Every one of us is uniquely gifted and wired specifically on purpose for a purpose. So when I'm looking for people, I'm looking in those veins. I'm looking for people that we don't currently have who are going to bring something we're not currently hearing or seeing at the table. Now, I have a 5C framework that I talk about in the book that I look for when we're doing uh, hiring, right? When I'm, I'm looking mm -hmm. for a team member or looking for a leader, these are the 5Cs that I'm looking for. And, and one of them is very specific to our context, but I think it's transferable uh, even beyond that. The first one is calling. Uh, you need to be called to do what we do, because if you're not, you're going to leave when it gets hard and it will get hard. Mm -hmm. I promise. So that's important. But I think in outside of a church context, this translates into, are you called to be a part of what we're doing? Do you buy into the mission? Do you get it? Yeah. Are you committed to Absolutely. that? That's the first C. Uh, the second C is character. Uh, character matters a great deal in my environment. I believe that is that is critical. But I think character matters in any leadership environment. And if you doubt that, all you have to do is take a look in the news and you can see leaders from every sector uh, who ended up in a ditch because of a character issue that wasn't addressed. Character is critical. Uh, a third is chemistry. Is there chemistry around the table uh, with the other people on the team? Uh, I like to work with people that I like to work with. <laughs> that doesn't mean we're all alike, but it does mean that we enjoy one another and enjoy one another's differences. That's something you'd learn to do and you choose to do. If I'm the smartest person in the room, I've heard said that I'm in the wrong room. If I'm in a room full of people who are just like me, I'm really in the wrong room, <laughs> right? I wanna be surrounded by people who are gonna make me better, who are gonna help me grow. That's part of chemistry. Uh, the 4C has to do with competency. Um, can you do what it is we're asking you to do? I'm not saying you have to do it per with perfection. Nobody is going to get there. But are you bringing the best of yourself? Do you have the ability to do cookies on the bottom shelf here? Can you do what we ask you to do and then get better from there? That's important for me. The last C is culture. Every organization has a culture, right? We know this. Is this person going to be a fit in our culture? And so we spend a lot of time talking about that. Uh, we have not moved forward with candidates because of just about every one of those C's. Probably chemistry and culture being the two biggest. Because if there's not chemistry with the rest of the team, yeah, it's, it's not going to be a good fit. It's not going to be a good environment for everybody. It's not going to be a good environment for you as the candidate. We need to be honest about that. If it's not a culture fit, we need to throw a flag really quick and we need to say, this is not okay. Um, this is not, you know, you're great. Uh, we think we're great, uh, but this is not going to be a good fit going forward because there's a, a culture mismatch. You need to know that. Yeah, and, and you're, you're touching on it. I just want to highlight that like interviewing for roles in your organizations, it's not about passing judgment on whether a person's good or bad. It's, no. it's about understanding is will this person's personal journey mm -hmm. and career arc and the story mm -hmm. arc of their life and career and the whole thing, because we don't get to just completely separate our work life from who we are. Like the, right. the, when we try to do that, we inevitably create imbalances that 
snap back like that rubber band, right. right? And yeah. so it's it's really about saying, is there alignment and is this time and is this journey worth sharing? And I think we can probably all think about examples. I used to have a business partner who I think is a great person who mm-hmm. is building a great company and we just never worked. Yeah. We just never saw eye to eye. And, and that's okay. And I still think he's a great person. I still think he's building a great company. I, it was just one that I couldn't be part of. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's fine. And I think that we often as people get confused and we make things personal that don't need to be made personal. Yes. And sometimes we don't make personal things that should be like, yes. and, and recognizing that some of these decisions really do need to encompass the entirety of a person and the entirety of an organization uh, to understand whether or not it's it's really going to work and, and for any amount of time, let alone for, for we, we try to hire these folks like we think they're going to work for us for the next 175 years. And it's like, you know, can we get five years of good alignment based on where this person is in this career? And maybe then it's worth doing. Like, so we've got to be a little bit more um, realistic sometimes about what our expectations are. And, and yes. but also we have to hold true kind of to your your five C's. Like, we have to decide, hey, what's important for us to make sure we're getting right in this hire? Otherwise, it could be detrimental to the overall organization, and nobody wants that. The last question that I want to ask you about is, is is something that I think kind of ties a lot of this together, but we haven't really spent any time on it in our conversation today, is this notion around family and the need to be, or the the benefits potentially of being family focused as a, as a leader. Can you talk a little bit about that and why you've kind of brought that into um, the, the work you're doing in leadership and why you think it's so important? I think that the tendency is to see people on our teams uh, in 2D to see them as what they do, the function that they provide, the tasks that they accomplish. And I understand that tendency. I've certainly fallen into that that pit myself. But I've learned over time that there's so much more value when we see people for who they are. They're not just an employee. They're not just a team member. They're they're also a husband or a wife. They're, they're a mom or a dad, right? They're a son or a daughter. We have to understand that there is a context to their lives that is beyond just what we see in the office or on a Zoom call. When we understand that, when we take that into account, we begin to exhibit what I call a family focused. That's one of the principles of catalytic leadership. When you do that, you begin to say, hey, you know, one day somebody else is going to sit where I sit. One day somebody else is going to sit where you sit, Anthony, right? We're not going to be doing this 100 years from now. Right. Knowing that, when we're at the end of our lives, who's going to be there with us? Is it going to be the people that we work with? Probably not. It's going to be those closest to us, right? I've spent a lot of time with people at the end of their lives. And I got to tell you, I've never once heard anybody say, man, my biggest regret is I wish I had spent more time at the office. I wish I had spent more time on this project. No, the regrets I hear have to do with relationships with those closest to them has to do with family. Well, I don't want to get to the end of my road and and have those same regrets. I want to learn from other people. And so what I help leaders to see and what I coach them to do, no matter their context, is to remember this. Make this a priority. Because if you don't make the relationships with those closest to you a priority, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get to the end of your life and you're going to regret that. You're going to wish you had. I want to help you avoid that by being intentional. And that's how we close a podcast episode with some strength. That is that is the ultimate closeout statement if I've ever heard one. So, William, we are absolutely out of time. But I think, I mean, I, I, I make light of it, but I really should. Like, that's not making light of it. That's just recognizing that it doesn't get more important than that. And that is... I think as important of an uh, of a note to end on as it could possibly be. So please understand that I'm extremely sincere about like we all need that reminder yeah. every now and then um, and to, to orient towards that. And we could probably all think about moments in the last day, if not the last month of, of 
times where we thought, oh, yeah, that's that's the most important thing. So yeah. I appreciate you highlighting that. And yeah, I, I thoroughly, genuinely enjoyed this conversation and, and, and <laughs> learning you. from you and, and talking with you. I feel like we could talk for five more hours and it would all be interesting and worth listening to. So I'd love to have you back on the show at, at some point again in the future. But um, William, thank you so much uh, for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Anthony, thanks for having me. This is this has been a joy and, and I'm with you. I'd, I'd love to keep talking. Great. And so, um, you know, in, in the spirit of continuing to talk, like, what's the best way for folks uh, that are listening to this or watching this on YouTube? Um, what's the best way for them to, to find you out in the world? You can find me at catalyticleadership.net. That's the website. You can learn more about the leadership coaching that I provide to leaders. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, just look for William Attaway. Uh, and I would love to, to make an offer to the listeners of your show, Anthony. Um, if you would like a free copy of this book, my newest book, Catalytic Leadership, I would love to make that available to you. If you go to catalyticleadershipbook.com uh, and you help me out with the shipping cost to get that to you, I'd love to just provide a free copy of that because I want to get this message into as many hands as possible. I want to see leaders get better. I want to see them grow intentionally. I want to see them choose to prioritize what matters. We appreciate that, and I will certainly include uh, the the links to that in the show notes as well. Um, and and I can definitely resonate with wanting to reach as many people as possible and just get these ideas into their hands. I mean, that's why I do this podcast. That's why I've got my own book. Like, very much relate to to what you're doing, and I really appreciate it. I think it's it's doing a lot of good, and it's 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 great for folks. So so thank you again. This has been just tremendous. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you all out there for joining us today. As always, you'll find more information about our guests and links in the show notes. We'll have it all covered. So go to dataleadershiplessons.com to subscribe and check out past episodes and accelerate your journey with training at dataleadershiptraining.com. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact.